Good morning. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome Hong Kong to Toronto. We've been looking forward to you delegates joining us here. And in fact, in your honor, we opened the Union Pearson Express on Saturday, just so we could transport you here and you wouldn't have to worry about taxis or Uber or anything else to get you into the city. So welcome and thank you for bringing Hong Kong and all that Asia has to offer to our very vibrant business community here. Uh, many of you may be aware, I in fact relocated to Toronto after spending 14 years in China and Hong Kong. I very wisely relocated in January and had an amazing month of February getting used to the cold again. Um, not surprising, a lot of my friends in Asia and here at home ask me what it's like to be back in China. Without question, we are an incredibly dynamic, livable city with tremendous international potential. And while June is a much easier month to reside in this city in than February, and uh, while we do have some exciting news for the Leafs with Babcock being back in town, the most important, or with Babcock coming to town to help coach us, the most important thing of opportunity for us is that the business community and every level of government in Canada is focused on how do we diversify our economy, how do we look at tremendous growth markets like Hong Kong and Asia. Here at the Board of Trade, we've launched a multi-year trade accelerator called TAP GTA, Trade Accelerator Program, TAP. And this has our largest business company, our largest companies in the business community sponsoring their high potential export ready companies into a trade activation program. We're hoping over the next three years to help 1,200 companies go through this trade accelerator program. We're hoping that at least a third activate and that half a billion dollars of new export business is created out of the GTA. And we're very hopeful that a big chunk of that will be headed to, towards Hong Kong. GTA is very important in terms of the context of the Canadian economy. We generate 20% of Canada's GDP and we're home to 40% of Canadian corporate headquarters. We have the second largest number of industry clusters in North America, such as financial services, food and beverages, life sciences, aviation, and ICT, to name a few. And in many of these clusters, we rank in the top three or better. Our natural trading partner historically has been the U.S., and this will uh, be a continuing important uh, trading partner for us. But over the past decade, and comp compounded by slowing consumer markets in the U.S., Ontario's export volumes have actually declined from $168 billion in 2003 to $165 billion in 2013, as our businesses haven't been poised to access the fast and growing markets in the world, especially Asia. In contrast, the state of Illinois, with a very similar economic profile to Ontario, and Chicago to Toronto, has not suffered the same fate. In 2004, Ontario exports to China totaled $1 billion, while, while Illinois were $900 million. Fast forward a decade, and Ontario's exports to China have grown from $1 billion to $2.2 billion, while the state of Illinois has grown from $900 million to $5.7 billion. And three of their top five trade sectors with China are areas where we're a powerhouse in North America, far stronger in those categories than the state of Illinois. So there's lots of opportunity for GTA businesses and for Ontario businesses to get much more activated in these high growth markets. Now, what are the reasons why Canadian business is not as active in exports? In May, the board published an export strategy report, the first time a metro region in Canada had looked at the barriers, the potential barriers to export by the business community. We interviewed companies that are already exporting to find out why they weren't exporting more. We interviewed companies that weren't presently exporting to find out why not. And interestingly enough, the reasons that they're not exporting or exporting more are the same. They're just ranked in different order. Uh, but they uh, range from things like lack of senior management time to consider export markets lack of internal experienced international resources to help them with market research, and difficulty finding customers, partners, or agents in other markets. All of these points are solvable, and while our TAP program will take a multi-year approach to addressing these barriers, 
Today's Think Asia, Think Hong Kong program provides a more immediate start, with our attendees from government and business in Canada having a first-hand opportunity to start thinking about why not Asia and why not Hong Kong. So in terms of that question, why Asia, why Hong Kong, here are a, a few points to ponder. Asia has been producing more millionaires than private bankers. According to a February headline in Hong Kong's South China Morning Post, there is a severe shortage of private bankers. The growth of millionaires in Asia has attracted many private banks, as well as luxury retailers to set up in Hong Kong as a stepping stone to access China and the Asia region. And the case of some of these luxury brands, such as Prada, their IPOs were floated on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to capitalize on China's love of luxury brands. But with all this rapid growth, talent gaps and retention are the biggest barriers faced by many businesses. And it's not only about millionaires. Asia's economic boom has created the world's fastest growing middle class. By 2020, half of the global middle class will be in Asia. With growing purchasing power comes growing aspiration, driving stronger demand for property, cars, education, healthcare, and better food. The growth of the middle class market is triggering increasing demand for retail banking services, consumer lending, and small business services. It's attracted a huge influx of retailers like Zara, Club Monaco, and Lululemon, as well as restaurants like Starbucks, Pizza Hut, Toronto's New York Fries, and BC's Triple O's. And it's not just international businesses that are taking advantage of Hong Kong to access Asia. Record numbers of mainland Chinese companies now use Hong Kong as a base for international expansion, citing Hong Kong's strength and experience in international marketing, sourcing, and financing, as well as its role as a renminbi settlement center. And as has previously been mentioned, last year we were awarded RMB Settlement Center status following Hong Kong, London, and Singapore as among the top financial centers in the world with this status. There's a panel this afternoon that speaks to this huge opportunity and one where our first mover advantage should help us tremendously in North America. These points provide the context for me to introduce our Think Asia, Think Hong Kong panel this morning. The growing global economic shift to East and the rise of Asia's emerging markets is undisputed. Hong Kong is perfectly placed to help overseas companies sell their goods and services in Asia, particularly the Chinese mainland. We have an outstanding panel of prominent business leaders who will share their experience and insights, realizing opportunities in the booming markets of Asia. I'll now introduce and welcome our panelists on stage and invite them to make five to seven minutes of remarks about their organization, what the rise of Asia has meant for their companies, and why Hong Kong. First, Benjamin Hung, CEO, Greater China, Standard Charter Bank. Standard Charter Bank traces its Hong Kong history to 1859, and since 1862 has been one of Hong Kong's three banknote issuing banks. Listed on the London, Hong Kong, and Mumbai exchanges, Standard Charter is a bank firmly anchored in Asia. 90% of their incomes come from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And the recent rise of Asia has had a huge impact on their banking operations, both private, retail, SME, and corporate. Joining us today is Ben Hung, Regional CEO, Greater China for Standard Chartered Bank. Ben's complete bio is in your program, and in addition to Asia, his international banking experience spans the UK and Canada. Ben, welcome to Toronto, if you'd like to join us on stage. <laughs> Following Ben will be Jim Thompson, Chairman and Founder, Crown Worldwide Group. Jim is probably one of the best known entrepreneurs in Asia. The economic growth of Asia has dramatically been felt in the movement of talent and their families and the movement of goods internationally and within Asia. In 1965, with $1,000 in his bank account, Jim Thompson founded Crown to address the need for international moving services in Asia. Today, Crown Worldwide, headquartered in Hong Kong, is the largest privately owned international removals company 
with warehousing and transportation services offered through 265 worldwide locations in almost 60 countries, including an office here in Toronto. Crown is also a leader in the field of document management with 26 million cartons of documents managed from its worldwide facilities. Um, and Jim and Crown more specifically have also won the hearts of many in Hong Kong when several years ago he opened Crown Wine Cellars in what was an abandoned World War II munitions bunker in the Hong Kong hillside. Today, it's recognized as one of the finest wine cellar cellars in the world. Jim, I've been talking to some restaurateurs here in Toronto. They want to learn more about this phenomenon. John, Jim is clearly a man with a strong read of market opportunities. Jim, could you join us on stage? <laughs> and representing China International Capital Corporation, Dr. Chu Gung, Chief Operating Officer, will be joining us. China International Capital Corporation, or CICC, was China's first joint venture investment bank. It was founded in Beijing in 1995 by China Jianying Investment, Morgan Stanley, China National Investment, the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation, and the Mingli Group. It opened its Hong Kong office two years after inception and became the operating base for its overseas businesses. CICC started initially with large overseas IPOs and gradually became the top underwriter of overseas listings, managing about 38% of overseas IPOs by Chinese insurers globally. Their clients are mostly industrial leaders in the sectors of oil and gas, telecommunications, energy, banking, and insurance. Joining us today is Dr. Chu Gang, Chairman of CICC Capital Markets Committee and Chief Operating Officer of the Corporation. He joined CICC in 2009 following his 16-year career with Citigroup. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, a real pleasure to be here in Toronto. Or should I say, real pleasure to be back in Toronto. I uh, used to work in Toronto in the 80s. I left uh, Toronto in 1992, the year when the Jays won the World Series. So, <laughs> Just on that subject, just nod if you've heard the names uh, Robbie Alomar, yeah, John Olerud, Cito Gasson. I'm talking to the right age group here. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, 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 ever since I left Toronto, I spent uh, uh, pretty much the last uh, 20 odd years uh, primarily in Hong Kong and in China. And it's really, really gratifying to see the transformational changes that China has, uh, has shown. Um, back in 1990, Greater China represented roughly 3% of world's GDP. Today, it represents around 14% of world GDP in a short space of 15 years. And fast forward ourselves to 2030, that number will likely be around 25%. And obviously, very naturally, Canada is a very, very big trading partner with, with China. And Canada China has a lot to do with agriculture, food products, energy, metals and mining, technology, financial services. The flip side, China into Canada, a lot to do with manufactured goods, machinery, equipment, uh, electrical goods, apparels, etc. So I think the, the roles that each play, it's a very, very much a role that is much of a complementarity uh, basis. Now, what I want to talk about is for Canadian businesses, fast forward yourself the next decade, the next 10 years. What are the few emerging themes you should all be thinking about doing businesses in Asia and for that matter in China? Um, the first theme is all about urbanization. Um, this is one of the core pillars that China will be embarking upon uh, in terms of uh, the next wave of growth is through urbanization. A typical Chinese urban dweller will consume three times more energy, 10 times more sugar, and uses a vast amount of infrastructure than its urban, uh, rural counterparts. China just very, very recently surpassed the 50% urbanizational mark, which means half of the population now lives in the cities. Now, as a comparison, Japan surpassed 50% mark in the 1960s. 
Korea did that in 1970s, so a lot, a lot more room to grow uh, for China. Just roughly about a quarter million people every week moves from the rural to cities, and if you fast forward three years, that's pretty much the population of the whole Canada having moved to, to live in cities. So therefore, the demand for resources, for commodities, for infrastructure, and for that matter, environmental and, 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 and the kind of clean technology is significant. I was recently going from uh, Beijing to Tianjin, and uh, usually it takes about a two, two and a half hour car ride. I decided to take the, uh, the high speed rail. It took me 30 minutes. And who provided the technology? Who provided, who manufactured the train? It's Canada's own Bombardier. The second theme I want to talk about is, um, I think Jana has touched upon it, is really the rise in the middle class. The past two decades, the whole world has been really powered by the billion middle class consumers in the West, primarily North America and Europe. The next decade will be very, very different. At least an extra billion, if not more, of the middle class will be added from the Asian markets, uh, from the current 500 million to well over two and a half billion. And that's primarily from China, but not only China, it's also Indonesia, Vietnam, India, you name it. Now, a very, very um, uh, significant uh, growth uh, in this middle class will be around consumptions. Again, whether it's through housing, through cars, mobile phones, white goods, banking, insurance sector, so on and so forth. And over half of the next decade's absolute growth in the world will be coming from Asia and emerging markets. Uh, and that's something that I think uh, Canada, uh, Canadian businesses should be thinking about. And of late, I, I, I start to notice in, in the streets of Beijing and Shanghai more and more people wearing shirt, 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 sweatshirts and hoodies uh, from Roots, and that's because they just recently opened a store there, which is fantastic. The third component is about the rising integration of China from a financial perspective, because China is now the second largest economy, going to become, hopefully in the next decade, the, the largest economy, and how this economy integrates with the world through financial means is going to be substantial. RMB is critical in that process, and already a currency of significance. It's already the fifth largest currency in terms of payment volume. Uh, more than 20% of China's trade globally is being conducted in, uh, in RMB. And, um, and uh, more than 60 central banks, sovereign wealth funds have already invested in RMB in terms of the reserves. So I think the next chapter will be China opening up its capital account, which will be significant, whether it's through Shanghai Hong Kong Connect, Mutual uh, Fund Recognition, Shenzhen Hong Kong Connect, RQ fee. That capital account process is going to offer a huge amount of opportunities for Canadian corporates, in particular, as Janet mentioned, that whole North American time zone in terms of Toronto being that RMB hub for the Americas. And these are the three areas I thought highlight that will represent a very, very good opportunity for Canadian businesses. And Hong Kong, very, very naturally, where do, where do we fit in? It's really, we've always, for the last 100 years, been the hub connecting between the East and the West. We offer a very, very good legal framework, good infrastructure, financial stability, naturally, the global RMB hub. So from, the, from that angle, um, I hope that you will all embrace, hopefully, the next decade of, of growth at office by Asia, for that matter, uh, by China. Um, I cannot leave the podium without making a plea. That plea is, China needs Tim Hortons. <laughs> so I really hope that in the next little while, I can order my double-double my and uh, maple glaze Tim bits in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. Well, thank you, and good morning, everybody. And I, I want to just start by saying that uh, Jan De Silva was one of our key people in Hong Kong. We hate to lose you. I hope you'll come back, or at least I guess you're promoting trade with Hong Kong in your new job. So, but she was a very key person for us we, in many ways in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a foreigner who started a business in Asia and primarily headquartered in Hong Kong, and a little bit about what I've experienced over there, because if any of you are thinking about this or, or already doing it, maybe you can relate to some of the things that I'm saying. As Jan said, I started my company in 1965, and in actuality, I started it in Japan, 
But it wasn't long before I moved to Hong Kong to set up our second operation. It was in 1970, actually. And it was then that I realized the difference in doing business, particularly in that case between Japan and Hong Kong, and I immediately felt this is where we should do our, our banking and our financial uh, accounting work and also any legal work we had because I saw how easy it was to do things in Hong Kong. So from that point on, Hong Kong became our headquarters. Over the 70s, we expanded throughout Asia. Uh, the service I was providing was the International Removal Service, and Asia was actually growing at that point, and more investors in, were coming to live there. And then in the, in the 80s, we expanded into a global company, and we had operations around the world. So I think I, could, I can speak authoritatively in saying that uh, of all the places we established, and we saw elements of tremendous bureaucracy, we saw in some countries tr uh, corruption uh, at government levels and customs levels, and uh, we saw high taxes in many areas as well. So as we evaluated each location during the expansion process, we concluded without question that Hong Kong was still the easiest place for us to headquarter our company and do business. And one of the things that uh, we found also is that uh, the ability to make money in Hong Kong uh, was much greater than any other lo location we had. In fact, we started making profits from the very first year we opened in Hong Kong, and we've never had a loss in all the years since, so it's been about 45 years. So it's, it's been great for us. So I, I want to just talk about some of the, I know you've had a litany of benefits of Hong Kong from the speakers this morning, uh, and I want to just touch on a few of them and how they related to me as I established my business. Uh, the first, I w the one I put at the top of the list that is an advantage for Hong Kong is, is the people of Hong Kong. We uh, have both blue collar and white collar workers, and I, I can tell you this is one of the greatest workforces you could have anywhere. We have uh, now about nine universities. I think when I started in the 60s, there were only about two universities in Hong Kong. Now we have nine universities, and we're obviously uh, pretty much just a service economy. Uh, in Hong Kong today. There's not much manufacturing anymore. But the, both the college graduates that we employ and also the drivers and packers and the blue collar workers, they are some of the dedicated and most hardworking people that I've found anywhere. Now I realize that Asians generally are very hardworking uh, and, and commit to their employer, but I have to say the combination of hard work, physical hard work, and intelligence has really been a big factor in the success of my company in Hong Kong. And I think anybody who employs people there would say exactly the same. Uh, the second one I'd like to stress, and, and this is the issue of taxes. Now, anybody who pays taxes knows that you like to pay as little as possible. But the Hong Kong system is qu quite amazing. Uh, as you probably know the number, it's about 15 percent, and it's a flat tax rate. And in fact, many of the Hong Kong uh, citizens don't play, pay any uh, income tax. I think the number is something like 65 percent don't pay income taxes because they don't fall into the tax net. But I think the important thing for that, and, and certainly in our case, was that not only did we make profits, but we were able to retain those profits, and those profits allowed us to reinvest in our business. So while we were quite young as a company when we started there, that uh, those earnings that we were able to reinvest around the world really helped build our global network. It was quite amazing how all of this sort of emanated from Hong Kong. And I'd make the comment that uh, despite the fact that Hong Kong has a very low flat tax rate, we have one of the best welfare systems. Best, so much money goes to education and so much money goes to social welfare. And year after year, we end up with a very healthy budget surplus. So I'm sure not too many uh, governments can can say that. The other thing that I feel as, as a, a foreigner in Hong Kong, I don't feel like a foreigner anymore but because I've lived there so long, but uh, uh, is this issue that was mentioned of a level playing field. Hong Kong is open to all businesses of all nationalities. It's been quite amazing. And on a personal basis, I have been asked to take part in many uh, activities, both on the Hong Kong government side, on the trade side, university side, and that sort of thing. And I feel very much a part of Hong Kong. And I'm not the only one. Many, many people like Jen and others were invited to take part in, in government committees and that sort of thing. So I think this level playing field is a wonderful aspect. Uh, the chief executive mentioned uh, something uh, called SEPA, the Closer Economic Partnership uh, uh, Association, or what is it? Agreement. Agreement. And, uh, 
And, and in fact, that was applicable to my company as, as a foreign-owned company in Hong Kong and many other foreign-owned companies, as long as you've been there for, uh, I think, five years was the requirement. And so that actually gave us, as a Hong Kong company, a foreign-owned Hong Kong company, access into China. And I guess that would be another uh, issue I would put on my list of benefits, and that is the fact that we have this access to China. And, and I think one of the advantages of Hong Kong is that the knowledge about China, the expertise in those companies that have made the mistakes and learned from them is in abundance in Hong Kong. So anyone who wanted to do business in China might find it very, very beneficial to stop off in Hong Kong first and learn either from consultants or from businesses that have operated there just how, uh, how that would work. And, and the other issue I would mention would be the, the legal system. Of course, that was touched on as well. But the, right, the rule of law in the legal system is unbelievable. This is one place where you can read in the newspaper where people can sue the government, challenge the government in courts, and actually win. And there are not many places in Asia where that really happens. But it does happen in Hong Kong because the legal system is so straightforward. And we have something called the ICAC, the International uh, Commission Against Corruption. And uh, that in itself is a wonderful body that was put in in 1975 to prevent corruption, which did exist at that time. And since that time, any company can now report their own employees or any suspicion they have about corruption going on, and the ICAC will investigate that. And I think it's, it's a, a tremendous benefit. So there are, there are many other aspects of, of the place, but I guess I would say that among, um, on top of everything, it's a wonderful place to live and work. I've lived there for 38 years. Uh, it's, a, it's a busy uh, cosmopolitan town. We have everything from the dense part of the city, which you see in all the pictures, to hiking trails and beaches. So it's really a great place to live as well as do business. And I think that my own experience there, as both as a businessman and as a resident, has, has told me that there are not many places in the world can, can meet this place. I realize that you're here because you have an interest in Hong Kong, and many of you may even be from Hong Kong, or you've certainly been there a lot. And uh, despite the people most commonly ask me, what's happened since the handover? Nothing from a business point of view. It's the same Hong Kong we've always had. It's a wonderful place to do business and, uh, and going strong all the time. So thank you very much and look forward to your questions. Good morning. Um, ben shared uh, his view from a local's perspective. Jim shared his view from a foreigner's perspective. I think it's fitting for me to share uh, experience from a Chinese company's express, uh, experience. Uh, hopefully from that experience you can see, uh, you have a feeling of uh, what Hong Kong is and what opportunities are for you. Uh, as Jan mentioned earlier, our company CICC uh, was created uh, 20 years ago. So, uh, so we, uh, together with Hong Kong, we uh, witnessed the growth of uh, Hong Kong's capital market. Our company was created uh, as a joint venture between Morgan Stanley and uh, a Chinese, Chinese bank uh, as a first international investment bank 20 years ago there's tremendous needs for Chinese companies uh, to raise capital. Uh, today, uh, we have 2,000 people uh, globally. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a large office in Hong Kong. We have office in London, New York, and Singapore. And we are a full service uh, investment bank. Uh, in addition to our strengths in IPOs, we also have large research capabilities servicing uh, institutional investors globally. We also have wealth management arm in China, and we also have asset management arm and investment arms. Uh, so we are basically a full service uh, investment bank. Now, 20 years ago, uh, when we were founded, and uh, Hong Kong market was developing, and Hong Kong was a special place for us because our first transaction uh, you know, our, our company was created uh, 20 years ago for two years, really soul searching what kind of business uh, we'll be doing, uh, what we're good at, et cetera. And uh, we did our first transaction uh, in Hong Kong, the IPO uh, listing of uh, China Mobile, uh, at the time it's called China Telecom, China Mobile uh, in Hong Kong Stock Exchange. 
uh, that itself is not just a transaction for us. It's actually a, a new way of reforming Chinese sovereign uh, state-owned enterprise. At the time, many, uh, many uh, Chinese companies, uh, we, we call them company now, at the time, it was part of a ministry. You have oil ministry, you have uh, telecommunication ministry, et cetera. So this was the time uh, when we together uh, taking advantage of Hong Kong as international financial center, uh, restructured uh, companies out of uh, social services, uh, created uh, really a modern enterprise and get them listed in Hong Kong Stock Exchange and, uh, and uh, via a, a international recognized corporate governance structure. At the same time, raise capital uh, for China. At the time, China is really uh, uh, in need of, of, of capital. So this really created a, a model for reforming and restructuring Chinese companies. So uh, after that, uh, we did about 60 of these transactions. And uh, so reform many industries uh, in China. And, uh, and this really, uh, uh, not only uh, we, uh, we as a company uh, grow uh, with this business, but also helping China uh, reform its businesses and companies and make the, um, really make the economic growth better, at the same time raising capital. It also benefits Hong Kong. Hong Kong also benefit from this growth of uh, listings, it became a, a, a larger capital market. For international investors, uh, there's also tremendous benefit. Uh, via Hong Kong, they uh, gain access to, uh, to Chinese uh, growth stories. Uh, today, Hong Kong is, uh, in terms of market capitalization, is the third largest in the world, only after the United States and China, with market cap north of five trillion U.S. dollars. About 1,800 uh, companies listed in Hong Kong Stock Exchange, half of them are Chinese companies. These are state-owned companies or private companies. In terms of market cap, the Chinese companies, even though the number is only uh, about uh, you know, half of the 1,800, uh, market cap is two-thirds of the Hong Kong market, and trading volumes is about two-thirds uh, of the whole Kong, Hong Kong market. So this speaks volumes about the strengths of Hong Kong as an international financial center. Uh, many people have mentioned uh, the long history of uh, a legal system, uh, and also free movement of ideas, capitals, and, 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 and businesses. Uh, I, I also want to mention the regulatory framework. Uh, you know, we operated in Hong Kong for many years. We fell uh, the high standard of Hong Kong's regulatory framework, and also the attitude of people, of regulators, to, to keep updating, to keep moving with the world, really uh, is, is ensures that Hong Kong will continue uh, to be a, uh, a really uh, uh, international, uh, international uh, financial center. Uh, now, 20 years has passed. Uh, I think uh, China is at a crossroad. Hong Kong is also at a crossroad. Um, the tremendous need by Chinese companies to raise capital uh, in the international market, uh, that has, uh, I, I wouldn't say it comes to an end, but is, is, is in the process, uh, a, a new tide is turning. Uh, this new tide is, is to have capital going outside China. The recent, uh, for, the last, uh, for the last year, there's a lot of development in the opening up of Chinese capital market. Uh, you know, people here talked about the Hong Kong Shanghai Stock Connect. Uh, in the second half of the year, the Shenzhen Shanghai Stock Connect. This really provides international investors access to Chinese companies. We've seen Canadian uh, institutional investors setting up offices in Hong Kong looking for these opportunities. Uh, so going forward, I, I, I really feel, you know, the Hong Kong story, so far we've seen uh, the tremendous growth and this is not ending. From where I see uh, the opening up of Chinese capital market 
and, and, and also there's, uh, on, on China side, there's also uh, more regulations, uh, more, uh, more uh, opening up policies will come up. This will make Hong Kong an even better place. Thank you.